Well, hello and happy Easter weekend. Good Friday marks the day that Jesus had you in mind when he made the ultimate sacrifice in order to reconnect us with our Heavenly Father. He did this because of his beautiful love for us. This service is built around that very thought. Pastor Leon will be leading us in communion a little bit later, so grab some juice and water, crackers and bread, whatever you have, so you're prepared for that later on. As well, hit the like and share button if you are excited to see the rest of the service because it's good. You know, as we go into worship, just a thought about it, a life of worship is ultimately a life of sacrifice and laying down what we think we know and putting our trust fully into Jesus. As we sing together, the words we declare are an expression of that decision we have made. So let's worship together. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my turn Till I met you I was breathing but not
God will never leave us behind, and He had a plan to reconnect us with Him, and that's Jesus. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says, God made Him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. That is why this whole weekend is so beautiful for us, reflecting on the absolute love from God towards us in the form of Jesus. Pastor Leon is gonna join us in just a bit and we're gonna do communion together. But before we do that, we have two very special videos for you that our creative and music teams prepared. Take a look. Relationship, rebellion, restoration. This is the pattern that we see all throughout the Old Testament. You see, God longs to be in relationship with us, but we go our own way. We rebel against Him. We turn our backs on God's love and His mercy. And the punishment for such rebellion is death. However, thousands of years ago, God created a system to fix this, a way to repair and restore us to Him. Enter animal sacrifices. Now, I know it may sound weird, but sacrifices, they were a major part of ancient culture. If you did something wrong and needed to get right with God, an animal would be killed and its blood poured out on an altar to cover your sin. You see, blood represents life. And the shedding of blood from a bull, a goat, or a lamb meant that its life was given in exchange for yours. Symbolically, it took the punishment of sin so you wouldn't have to. It bridged the gap. It restored your right standing with God until another sin was committed and another animal was needed. Blood upon blood upon blood upon blood. Animal sacrifices was messy and exhaustive work. And over time, the system grew meaningless to God's people. They became familiar with God's mercy and continued to commit evil. What we needed was a permanent solution. A solution so perfect that humanity, despite our imperfections, could live with a perfect God. Enter Jesus. When John the Baptist saw Jesus coming from afar, he shouted, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now in order to be deemed worthy of sacrifice, a lamb must be pure and perfect. Jesus was that spotless lamb. He lived a perfect life. And when he died on the cross, he willingly poured out his blood to cover every single sin that you and I would ever commit. You see, Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice that every other sacrifice had been pointing to all along. But the shed blood of Jesus wasn't provisional, meaning it didn't just temporarily cover our sin. It wiped it out. Every act of rebellion, every sickness, every disease for all of eternity. While the spilled blood of men cries out for vengeance, Jesus' blood speaks a better word. It speaks forgiveness. It shouts grace. It proclaims protection. It declares healing and it reunites us once and for all with our Heavenly Father. And now there's nothing standing in the way. The blood of Jesus has forever bridged the gap between us and God. And all we have to do is accept His sacrifice. And when we do, we receive His life. We receive a new and a better way to live in relationship with God. Because God now lives in us. That's the power of His blood.
speaks a better word, speaks a better word. It's singing out with light. It's shouting down the Hey everybody, it is so good to have you with us today, especially as we look at this Easter season at Jesus and the cross. Now, so many people have the cross wrong. We have a Christianity or a people who follow Christ have literally grown in fear and generation after generation Fear is what seems to permeate believers. And the Bible teaches us that Jesus came to give us peace 
with God. That's the whole message of the cross is peace with God. And instead, we've got religion, which is just kind of a mimicry of something. And we've got preachers who just scare people. I remember the pastors when I would go to teen camps and uh, go to youth retreats and youth conferences as a young man, and they would get up and just scare the hell, literally, out of you so that you would stay away from sin. And it didn't work. What it did was cause a generation of people to abandon any real um, life with Christ. We wouldn't abandon Jesus because we wanted to make sure we were born again. But even then, we weren't sure we were going to go to heaven um, if we died or got hit by a truck uh, or the rapture was to happen. All these doctrines, they, they just brought such fear. And it was passed down from generation to generation. And in Isaiah 53, 1, it says here, Who hath believed our report? Do you know why it starts out with that? Because the whole chapter is showing the incredible gospel. This good news of the gospel is the gospel of peace. But you see, when anyone gets their hands on religion, and not just Christianity, any religion, they will use religion to control the masses. I mean, People have literally gone to war with countries, holy wars, as, uh, and, and used fear to drive people and to control the nation. Um, preachers get up and they control their churches by using fear. I've seen it so often. I mean, TV preachers get up and they'll preach to the world such a fear-based message that if you as a believer do this, this, and this, you're going to hell or, or, or. So let's take a look at the cross, the gospel, because today's a great day to grow and to recognize that this is not the gospel. Even parents are watching me today and, you know, you literally will raise your children in Christianity, but without thinking we have been trained to use fear. And this fear to keep them away from sin, to keep them away, and we'll use verses to do that. But if we don't bring the gospel first, all you do is spread fear. And in Romans chapter 8 and verse 5 to 8, it teaches us here that those who think they can do this on their own end up obsessed with measuring their own moral muscle, but never getting around to exercising it in real life. See, we've got to recognize that the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's not the gospel of you or me. And anybody that gets themselves in the center of the gospel gets so messed up because the gospel, you're not at the center. It's Jesus that is at the center of this beautiful gospel of peace. Now, what you believe about righteousness is what controls everything in Christianity. What you believe about righteousness is what determines whether or not you live in fear or victory, whether or not you are just um, dealing with condemnation and guilt. And in our world, the most dangerous people are the ones whose motives are to help people, but they don't trust Holy Spirit, and the gospel. So they use carnal methods of performance and they teach people that they must perform inside the law to be righteous. And it's just a mess. When you take a look at the Word of God, you'll understand the Bible talks about sin and it says that we're no longer slaves to sin, but it also talks about dead work. Now, dead works, think about this. This is your effort to be better with God, 
to be more righteous with God, to earn God's healing power, His blessing power, make Him happy with you, make Him pleased with you. There's all these different words that preachers over the years, parents, uh, people have used to keep people in fear lest they go too far into sin. But they don't understand that the power of the gospel is understanding righteousness. Everything in the Bible today, everything in the Old Testament, everything you read in the New Testament, it must come with what we call through the cross. You must have an understanding of his death, the bear, his burial, his resurrection, and Jesus ascending to the right hand of the Father and sitting down. Um, until you understand that, Everything in the Bible, you'll try to take everything in the Bible to beat yourself up and to beat people around you up with it. And when you do that, you're back to religion. You're just back to what Jesus came to give us, freedom. And he came to give us peace and joy. And Romans 5.17 says he came to give us righteous, or we are in right standing with God as a gift. Oh my, this is the message of the cross. Otherwise, the cross hasn't changed anything. In the Old Testament, your performance is what got you blessed. In the New Testament, it's Jesus' performance that gets you blessed because it comes down to what makes you righteous. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, in verses 2 to 5, the apostle Paul is saying here to the Corinthians, I determined not to know anything amongst you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. You see, it's one thing to know the historical Jesus. You know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John show us the historical Jesus. People with their five senses recognized and knew Jesus. And we have letters and hundreds and thousands of people that saw him, they touched him, they heard him. I mean, literally, they ate with him. Uh, the, the sense, all their senses proved the historical Jesus. But now when he dies, and what took place on the cross, and those 40 days and the time after, this is where so few people understand the cross. The prophets of old, they literally prophesied as to what Jesus, not the historical Jesus who walked on the planet, but the risen Lord, what happened. And this is where the Old Testament begins to, all over the place, have these beautiful buried nuggets uh, of who Jesus was and what he did. Now, Hebrews 1, 1 and 2 says, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days, everything after the cross is called the last days. It's a time period. It says, has in these last days spoken to us by his son. Now, when you literally interpret the Bible, uh, you are to interpret it through the son because Holy Spirit is going to speak to us, but he's going to speak to us and he's going to show us what Jesus, the son of God, did. And so the, the entire Bible now, as he speaks to us, has to be spoken through what the Son did. And it says, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. The cross, you know, years ago, when the Roman Empire finally embraced the cross and the message of Jesus, they still didn't get it. I mean, they painted the cross on their shields as a magical symbol when they went into war. Um, and, and there's just a whole bunch of misunderstanding that took place from that point and on. And But when you look at the 12 apostles, and as they went forth, and cities were reached um, for, with the power of God, it's fascinating to see 
that the message of the cross brought such incredible power. Now, many Christians have abandoned this message of the cross, and it's especially the ones who scream the most about um, Christianity not going back to its roots, but they've missed it. Most of Paul's letters were to convince people that the law and trying to obey it to be righteous, that's dead works. Now, the law is beautiful. It shows us how to get along, how to build cities, families, nations, how to you know, govern uh, countries, but you can't become righteous by obeying the law. That's considered dead works. Everything you try to do, so as you try to obey the law, if you're doing it from the perspective of getting God to like you, love you, help you, do something for you, you are back into dead works. But if you recognize that Jesus gives you your righteousness, so you're righteous, he's laughing and loving and smiling at you, God, but his power is also given to you that you can get up and sin no longer has dominion over you, um, that you are righteous and now you can live no problem free from sin. If you get the cart before the horse and you go, well, you've got to be righteous to have God's power, well, now you don't have God's power to live righteous and right. And this is a crucial, crucial part of the gospel. You are never going to experience the power that is available to you until you understand the cross properly. And I'm going to just go on, on record right now, and I've done this many times as saying, that it's rare for me in my travels, different places, wherever I've gone around the world, the different denominations that I have met with and preached with, the places, the people. It's very rare to find someone who walks in the power of the gospel because of the attack that comes from religious leaders about living right. Now, of course we all want to live right. I want me to live right. I want my wife to live right. I want my kids to live right. But that's not the message of the cross, okay? Now, when you understand that to be righteous with God is because Jesus, there was this great exchange that took place. He took my sinful life and He gave me His righteous life. He took my sinful nature and He gave me the nature of God. Like This exchange is so gorgeous, it's so beautiful. And in 1 Corinthians 1.17, Christ did not send me to baptize, is what Paul is saying, but to preach the gospel, not in cleverness of speech. Today I watch all these young, famous preachers rising up and all the beautiful, powerful, amazing, unique public speaking abilities and gifts that they have. And, and they're so good at taking a one word and blasting it away, but they're not going into the power of the cross, so many of them. And it says here, not in cleverness of speech, so that the cross of Christ would not be made void. In 1 Corinthians 15, 55, it says, O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? Then in 56, it says, The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. Now, it doesn't say that the strength of sin in your life is your disobedience. It doesn't say it's you doing things wrong because it, it, you literally, when could you ever stop on your own power? But here it's saying the strength, what gives sin in your life power is the law. And trying to obey the law in order to have the power of God, the presence of God, the ability of God. And, if, and that's where most Christians are. If I was to go pray with somebody and say, okay, what do you need a miracle for? The first thing that you can see when you look in their eyes is they're hoping that they're going to get healed on my righteousness. Leon, could you pray for me? I'm going, oh, of course, but 
You can see that they don't believe they're righteous enough. They're hoping I am. They'll go to different pastors and evangelists and, and they want to get healed, for example. And they're just praying that the gift on them and the gifts of the Spirit in them and that person's lifestyle is so good that somehow it'll break through you know, their lack of living right and, and their depression and unhappiness and lust and, and bad thoughts and anger and jealousy and envy and pride and all the stuff they're working with, that it, it'll just break through that and get me a miracle. And what they don't know is that all of those things that they're dealing with in their own strength, if they would first go to the cross and understand that as a born-again believer, you are righteous. And that because of that, you now have access to all of the power of God to live with joy and peace, to continue to plant the right God's word in your heart, which is the autopilot of your future, and then begin to walk out of bad habits, walk out of sin. You begin to have harvest after harvest of joyful living and all the things you're trying, all the pleasures you're trying to get, um, on your own, you recognize that He is literally going to give you every pleasure and every blessing that He created for you the right way. It's just we've messed it up. Now, Colossians chapter 2 and verse 14, listen to this carefully. And men, listen to this over and over. And because so many people listening to me, the majority of people listening to this, you struggle with guilt and condemnation. And you don't realize it, or maybe you do. But a lot of people have just tuned it out and, and they don't realize that that is why you don't rise up with such strength of faith and obedience. You see, to really have faith in God Obedience and faith are so synonymous that it's easy to obey God when you believe that you, you're righteous, you're the son of God. There's no good thing is he going to withhold from you who walk uprightly. Well, in the new covenant, it's because Jesus walked uprightly that we get this favor of righteousness and this blessing of God. And now it's so easy to rise up and to win over the sin that so easily besets you before, etc. Here in Colossians 2, 14 and 15, it says, having canceled and blotted out. Now, that, that's like a, an eraser on a chalkboard, just erase and wiped out the handwriting of the note with its legal decrees and demands, which was in force. And it stood against us, hostile to us. This note with its regulations and decrees and demands, he, Jesus, set it aside. What? And he cleared completely out of our way by nailing it to his cross. All right. Oh my, this is an amazing portion of scripture. Reading from the Amplified, it is saying here that when Jesus died on the cross, this issue of you being righteous by always offering lambs or an animals and the spilling of blood to, to, to just kind of cover your sins again, it says that Jesus set it aside and cleared out completely the law that you have to obey to be righteous. He nailed it to his cross and, and so many other verses for time's sake I wish I could get into. And it says, he performed perfectly. He lived perfectly. He died perfectly perfectly. He became your sin. He took sin. And what's really cool, and this is what a lot of people don't get, is that the law was nailed to the cross. So this contract to live righteous and right with God and to be treated as a person in the family of God living righteous, it's what Jesus did for you. Now all the promises are yours as a born-again believer Okay, before you get your living perfect. Jesus lived perfectly. All the blessings come your way. And when you begin to understand this, you begin to recognize how much God loves you, how much God cares for you. And when you go to pray and you believe about, about something with God, you need to recognize that right now you can be healed. Right now, God's smiling. Right now, God's blessing is all for you. And you, you're looking at yourself so much 
The Bible says now there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. You know, they had to add a sentence to kind of clear that up. They were so shocked by it, the biblical translators, but now there is no condemnation when you are really born again. And I'm saying that because many people think that being at church makes them a Christian or praying a prayer makes you a Christian. But no, it says believing on Him, confessing Him with your mouth, believing at that heart level. I believe there are many people who think they're Christians, but because they went to church, tried to obey the law, prayed, repeated a prayer, but never really looked at this and believed on Jesus. They're not born again. And so they're trying to, 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 to live this way. And you need to just, first of all, when you hear this, just say, Jesus, come into my heart. I give you my life and I want to follow you. And then stay in God's word because Jesus literally, he, it's called the great exchange. When he died on the cross, he became sin. He took the curse of the law and he moved the law itself out of the way of being righteous. And now as you come to Jesus, the entire law that makes you righteous in the old is moved, cleared out of the way because Jesus lived it out perfectly. And as a gift, you get to be a part of his family. You get to have all the blessing and the favor of God because of what he did on the cross. Again, Colossians 2, 14 and 15 in the Amplified says this, Jesus, having canceled and blotted out wiped away the handwriting of the note. Now, remember that when God gave Moses the commandments, it says that it was the finger of God writing on the rock, and, and, and Moses brought them down, and it says this is the handwriting of the note with its legal decrees and its demands, which was in force, and it stood against us. It was hostile to us. Why? Because when you didn't obey the law... There was a curse that came with it for not obeying it. Jesus took the curse and your punishment, your sentence. He took it for everything past. And the Bible says that he took the law out of the way of being righteous. Now, people are so obsessed with this. Well, Leon, without the law, how do we know how to live right? Okay, I get what you're saying. But re just recognize this, that the law is still beautiful in that once you're born again and you're righteous in Jesus, you look at that and you go, wow, the Ten Commandments as you study them are a great way to form a country. Um, the laws of great countries today were formed on the Ten Commandments, on Judeo-Christian principles. So I love that. I've got no problem teaching my family the Ten Commandments. It's just that the Ten Commandments are not my our way to be right with God. That is our way to live and to live a life and to raise up families, generations, cities, provinces, states, countries. These are great things to show us how to get along together and how to live. So, But it's not how we are righteous. And here is where so many people struggle. I want to encourage you today that when you think about the cross and Jesus dying for you, remember this, it is about righteousness. The Bible says very clearly that when we look at the cross, that the, 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 the in, I think it's uh, Acts chapter 1 and verse 16 where it talks about the power. So I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew and the Greek. And then it starts talking about righteousness. I mean, oh my, this righteousness that is yours. When you prayed the prayer, Jesus come into my life and you believed on him, you were born again. Right there, you became totally righteous in your spirit man and able now to have every one of God's promises and the power of God in your life. So when you need his promises, his power, you don't look at yourself and your behavior, you look at Jesus and his behavior. And then you begin to have this confidence, this peace, this joy, that you are in right standing with God. And from that powerful position, you begin to live in a way you could never live 
before. If you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, I challenge you right now to say, Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross and for paying my way to be in God's family. Come into my heart, come into my life. I'm following you the rest of my days in Jesus' name, amen. Welcome to the family of God. Now listen to me, this life that is ahead of you, <clears throat> there has been a great exchange because you've chosen to believe on Jesus. And there's so much to learn. And the enemy will try to stop you from learning, stop you from growing in wisdom and, and changing the way you think, uh, the way you believe. So you've just started the most exciting journey. But if you want to walk in a greater understanding, keep following us. Uh, keep learning God's Word so that you don't become another statistic of somebody who's trying to earn God's favor, blessing, on your own. Instead, the real message of the cross is that righteousness is a gift. Being right with God, um, being God so pleased with what Jesus did that it affects all of your life as well. And as Jesus is, so are we in this world. God bless you. One of the beautiful things that the Bible talks about is having communion, taking communion together. Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took the cup and the bread, and together he had communion with his disciples. And the Apostle Paul talks about it in Corinthians 11 and what it means. And we're about to do this. I want to just say one thing as we go into this, so many of us were raised that when we took communion, if there was any sin in our life, that we could become sick and they would, or, or we become, you know, real problems. I remember them passing around communion in church and people wouldn't take it because they knew that they're not, they weren't sure there was, they were clean and clear. And it would say here in this chapter that this is the reason many are sick and many die because they don't look at this properly. And, and, but what it's saying here is that when you look to Jesus as your righteousness, that is when, in fact, that's the reason we take communion because Jesus' blood was shed. Jesus' body was broken for us so that we are righteous as a gift. Romans 5, 17. And so, so many people would talk here, and, and, and this verse goes on in 1 Corinthians 11, talking about how you take communion. You gotta be careful. Well, it's not saying that you gotta make sure you live right. You personally remove every sin from your life to take communion. It's saying you look and believe on Jesus as your righteousness. And then as you do that, it's a great reminder to you that He empowers you and to rise up with faith and obedience and easily begin to live right for Him. But if you have to live right in order to take communion, you're going to find that you'll always walk in condemnation. So wherever you are today, um, with your family, your spouse, you can do communion together. You just need a little piece of bread or cracker, a little bit of juice or, or something, um, and use that and just sit down. Now, Jesus, when He was with His disciples having communion, He said to them, this is my body which is broken for you. He said, do this often in remembrance. It's crucial for us as Christians to remember the new covenant. We are new covenant people and that we have this ability to live in this new covenant because Jesus died in our place. And so he says, this is my body broken for you. Every disease, every sickness, he took the entire curse of the law so we could walk in health and victory and blessing and joy as a gift, not because you performed so good. Thank you, Jesus, for dying in my place. Thank you for taking the entire curse of the law, as it says in Galatians chapter 3, that I can walk knowing you 
and living in the favor and blessing of God. Let's partake together. The Bible goes on to say that Jesus took the cup and he said, this is my blood that was poured out for you. And you know, the Bible teaches us that without the shedding of blood, there is no removal, remission of sins. You know, when the animals that they sacrificed to be able to walk with God's blessing on their lives and have that sin covered, it worked, but that wasn't the way God wanted it. And when John the Baptist saw Jesus, he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. When we do communion, it is to remind us that the covenant, the agreement that we have with God is because of what Jesus did, not because of what we do. And so he took the cup and said, this is my blood, and it's shed for you. And the disciples who understood blood covenants, they knew what was happening. But today in our world, people don't understand what's happening. You need to know that just like you can have a lawyer and you can sign documents in triplicate and make sure that that agreement is real. This agreement is so powerful that in the courts of heaven, you are born again and your sins have been dealt with once and for all, 2,000 years ago. The Bible doesn't say that Jesus has to go die again because you uh, sinned again. No, it was final. It was done. And so let's remember today that because Jesus died and his blood was spilled, we forever have a covenant that says we are righteous because Jesus qualified us. Let's partake right now. Father, I pray right now for each person watching. I pray that you would just cause a revelation to take place that because of Jesus, we are right with you and in your family. Because of Jesus, every promise in the Bible we have been qualified for. So I speak healing right now into physical bodies. I declare right now peace in the home and in their mind. I declare right now that joy will dominate every lie that they have believed. And that from today on, there's a sense of wonder, joy, and strength in knowing Jesus. And Father, as they go to your word each day in their prayer time, guide them and lead them into this victorious life of knowing what happened on the cross. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us for our Good Friday service. If you enjoyed the music and the special elements today, hit the like and share button so many others can see what you've just experienced. You are not going to want to miss what we've prepared for you this weekend. And we want to officially invite you to celebrate Easter with us right here on Facebook or YouTube. You choose, but there's so much to look forward to. We'll see you then.